Hello, and welcome to this MCMA and PMD webinar, Understanding Magnetic Technology. My name is Joanna, and I am the manager for the MCMA, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Attendees have joined this webinar in listen-only mode, which means that you are muted. If you do have a question during this webinar, please submit them in your questions panel. We will answer all questions at the end of this webinar. As a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. And now, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Stan Trout. Stan's professional life, just over 40 years, has been almost evenly divided between permanent magnet and rare earth industries. For the last 14 years, he has run a consultancy called Spontaneous Materials serving clients in these industries on a wide variety of technical and commercial projects. His previous employers include Molycorp, MagnaQuench, Hitachi Magnetics, Crucible Magnetics, and Racoma. Dr. Trout is a registered professional engineer in Pennsylvania and Colorado and holds a BS in physics from Lafayette College and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in Metallurgy and Material Science. He is a member of the MCMA, EMERF, and the UK Magnetic Society, and a senior member of the IEEE Magnetic Society. And now, I'd like to thank our sponsors of today's webinar. Dexter Magnetic Technologies is a single source for the optimized magnetic solution with AS91000 certified facilities. The company delivers the highest quality permanent magnets magnetic cores, and magnetic assemblies for the most demanding requirements, from medical to aerospace. Tangum Engineering Incorporated is the manufacturer of specialized isotropic and anisotropic injection molded ferrite and injected molded neodymium magnets and molded magnetic assemblies. They are dedicated to providing high quality products to uses of bonded magnets across several market segments, including automotive, medical, consumer, industrial, military, and defense. Innovation is the key to their business. And now, I'd like to hand it over to Stan to get started. Well, thank you, Joanna. I'm uh, happy to be here today. I'll say good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everybody along the way. Uh, I always like to start off with, uh, with a joke. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a picture of, of what we might have looked like uh, uh, circa 1930. Uh, if we wanted to listen to uh, music while we were walking around. Uh, the technologies for all these things existed, uh, but the picture highlights some of the uh, differences between uh, the way they would do things then and the way we, we might do things now. Uh, the headphones, that you may notice the little uh, uh, U-shaped horseshoe magnets there. Uh, that would be Alnico. That was typical of the time. Um, the vacuum tubes, uh, on his chest there would have been the way you would have amplified things. And uh, in order to run the vacuum tubes, you'd have to carry around a very large uh, lead acid battery pack on the back. So uh, apparently, there's somewhat smaller ways to do this uh, now. And so uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into uh, at least how, the, how magnets uh, affect all this. Um, so here are our topics that we'll go over. Uh, it's it's a kind of a quick hour. There's only so much we can. Uh, do, but uh, we'll get started here and, and, and maybe uh, uh, whet your appetite for something a little bit more later. Uh, I always assume everybody who's listened to my seminars has uh, attended the first grade. Uh, in some cases, people even remember what we learned there. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll do a little bit about magnetic theory. Um, magnets are complicated in the fact that they're, uh, while they're not linear, uh, they have these strange units. Uh, they're a little bit hard to characterize, uh, so it's, uh, it, it's always interesting there. So we'll go over that to try to um, unconfuse things, I'll say. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about ferromagnetism, and that's the basic physics building block, scientific building block, when if something's going to be magnetic, uh, more likely than not, we want it to be ferromagnetic. And it has to be able to do several things all at once. Uh, which is a little bit unusual in nature. And that's why the number of materials we have to look at is relatively small. And then finally, we'll just talk about permanent magnets, their basic properties, and the uh, uh, types of materials. Uh, and as Joanna said, uh, feel free to send me a question as I'm uh, uh, talking here. Uh, I have no problem if it's uh, 
if I can answer it while I'm still on the slide, I, I will. Uh, but we'll try to um, address everything either here or uh, or later on. So uh, Joanna gave me a nice uh, introduction, so I won't say too much more other than the picture on the left is um, uh, the, the one with the patina, the, the statuesque uh, looking guy, that's uh, uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, that's actually his uh, uh, birthplace in uh, Braunschweig in, in Germany. Uh, that picture was actually taken about this time of year. You can see the nice flowers out there. But uh, uh, So uh, I, I, I visited his, uh, his statue long ago. Um, so in first grade, what did we learn about magnets? Well, I think one of the things you probably would have learned is that this idea that uh, uh, magnets have poles. And so uh, we, we call them a North Pole and a South Pole. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But the, the one thing that you see when you hold small magnets in your hand is the idea that if we have like poles, two North Poles or two South Poles, uh, they repel each other. So that's what the first two uh, uh, pictures are trying to show. And the, the forces, the arrows are, are pointed outward. Uh, and then if the poles are opposite, uh, North and South together, then they attract. And uh, that, that's certainly true uh, in first grade and, and, and still true uh, uh, today. Uh, the one thing that your first grade teacher probably didn't say uh, that I, I'll say is the idea that um, uh, every magnet has a north pole and a south pole. And if we imagine taking one of these magnets and cutting it up and making it smaller and smaller, uh, we'd still be surprised maybe to find that um, our magnet still has a north pole and a south pole. Uh, so we can't get to a point by making it small enough to get uh, a single North Pole or a single South Pole. Uh, the physics theorists tell me that there's actually no prohibition on it, but uh, the, the practical fact is that we've never, uh, never found that. So we learned that magnets have poles. Uh, the other thing I think we learned in the first grade was the idea that uh, the Earth itself is a, is a magnet or said the other way that uh, we actually live in a, in a small magnetic field. Uh, the, the magnitude of this field is, is quite small. I, I mentioned it's 100,000 times smaller than what you might see if you uh, ever had an MRI. Uh, it's uh, maybe 1,000 times smaller than the magnet that's on your refrigerator. Um, it's, it's very tiny. But it's, it's a very important thing. It, it serves two purposes, which I'll mention in, uh, in a second. Um, we also might have learned that the uh, Earth has geographic poles, north and south, and it has magnetic poles. Uh, the magnetic poles and the geographic poles are almost in the same location, uh, but not quite. Uh, and that the magnetic poles actually move uh, over time. Uh, one theory is that at some point soon the uh, Earth's magnetic pole is going to flip. Uh, it's flipped before. Uh, I'd like to see that. I think that would be kind of fun. Um, the other thing, I guess, to, to say about the Earth's magnetic field, this is not a first grade topic, but it's a, it's a nice feature of it. Uh, one of the things that it does for us um, is that it deflects any charged particles that uh, are hurled at us, say, from the sun or elsewhere in the, in the universe. And uh, it deflects them uh, one way or the other. Uh, and they don't hit us. And, and so that's a nice feature. Um, so going back to my earlier comment about the Earth's pole uh, flipping, uh, we don't care about that feature so much because they would just be deflected to the left if they were deflected to the right before. Uh, but the other thing that's important is that the uh, magnetic field was the basis for the, the compass. And so uh, several centuries ago, people discovered this effect and were able to navigate across uh, oceans or seas like the Mediterranean uh, without hugging the coastline. Uh, it was a big deal. Uh, I guess the other thing to notice in the picture is the um, uh, what's at the North Pole. Uh, the bar magnet there actually says S, and it says N at the bottom. And you say, well, wait a minute, how can that be? And it's, well, if you remember the last slide, I just got done saying that opposite poles attract. And if you have a, a pole that's pointing north, uh, it must be being attracted to a, uh, a south pole. Uh, usually we get around this in the nomenclature by calling it a, a north seeking pole, meaning that it, it, it uh, is attracted to the uh, north geographic polar in that region. Uh, but some people get it confused, and uh, usually notes get put on drawings if, if somebody has a problem with that. 
and they'll do it the, uh, the other way around. The other thing we learned in first grade is the idea that we can actually see magnetic fields. Uh, our way of seeing them, uh, the old school way of doing it, is to take uh, uh, iron filings and sprinkle them across the magnet. Uh, the magnet on the left is what I guess you would call a bar magnet. Uh, the tips are the magnetic poles, and you can see kind of a, a heavier concentration of, of iron filings there. And this very nice pattern where things spread out and uh, find the other pole on the other side. Uh, the magnet on the right is a, a horseshoe magnet. Uh, the poles are actually on the tips, which are on the top there. Uh, you can see kind of the same effect. Uh, There's a nice way to do it. It, it. I will say it's much nicer if you're taking a picture of it rather than handling it yourself. This gets to be rather uh, messy. Uh, but uh, it is a nice way to see magnetic fields. I'd say the more modern way of looking at magnetic fields is to use something called uh, green paper. Uh, that's the picture on the left there. And you can see these alternating uh, light and dark regions of, of green. And that's actually showing the light regions of the division between uh, adjacent poles. And so um, one of the things I do when I do this in person is I'll bring in green paper and give it to people. And I'll also bring in some refrigerator magnets and have them flip it around and, and look at the uh, pattern on the back. The side that actually sticks to the refrigerator on the, on the magnet is, is where all the activity is. And so it's magnetized in the way that the magnetic flux tends to spray out uh, from the back. And that's what makes it able to, uh, uh, to stick. When it's magnetized correctly, it doesn't stick very well if you put it the other way around. But since it's an advertisement, you really don't want to cover up the advertising uh, part of it. Um, long ago, I used to do this with my nephew. Uh, he was probably about age 10. And he'd uh, uh, want something to do. And I'd give him a magnet and say, uh, Chris, why don't you uh, go around the house and, and, and see what you can find that the magnet will stick to. And so he'd come back uh, and maybe a half an hour later and say, well, you know, it, uh, uh, it didn't stick to the dog. Uh, it stuck to a few pots and pans in the kitchen maybe some shelving or the washer uh, or dryer. Uh, but uh, it didn't really do too much else. Uh, it did some interesting things with the um, uh, TV screen, because uh, it was back in the days of CRTs. And uh, so that was, that was good. Uh, it, it's a test that any of us can do. Uh, uh, most things, if, if a magnet will stick to it, we call that material magnetic. Uh, the more proper scientific names for it are um, ferromagnetic or a variant on that called ferrimagnetic. Uh, these are things that uh, respond very um, strongly to an applied magnetic field. Uh, the other materials that don't stick, uh, we usually just call non-magnetic, and that's fine. Uh, the more accurate scientific descriptions are called paramagnetic or diamagnetic. Uh, I think in the world of uh, uh, magnetic materials, there may be about 10 or 12 different variations on this that different words in front uh, to describe different things. But these four probably uh, capture quite a bit of the uh, possible things that materials can do. Uh, the, the figure on the right is trying to show us uh, a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, the little red arrows are representing uh, magnetic spins, we call them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the way that they respond to an applied magnetic field. Uh, in the top one, the ferromagnetic, uh, imagine the magnetic field is also applied upward and the spins align parallel. Uh, there's a type of material called antiferromagnetic. And um, there they uh, re balance each other out. They cancel each other out. It, it's not a particularly practical material because it has no magnetization. That's never a good thing for a magnet, I think. Um, the ferri magnetic, like I said, is a variant. Uh, some are up, some are down, but the down ones are a little bit smaller. And then paramagnetic, you may get a pattern like that. It could be random or some other pattern like that. The second test we can do to uh, uh, this magnet uh, that we've tested to see if it's magnetic or not is some materials won't remain magnetic once the magnet's been removed. And if you go into your shop, uh, a lot of the tools are made out of some steel. Uh, usually, they don't remain magnetized once they're exposed to a magnet. Uh, the exception to that might be your screwdriver. Uh, 
the tip on that will sometimes stay magnetic for some length of time. Um, it's a hardened steel. It's not a particularly good permanent magnet. But uh, of course, if you have something lost that you're working on, uh, uh, sometimes having a, a screwdriver tip that's magnetized briefly is, uh, is, is quite helpful. Um, so those are the two distinctions we make. Uh, the materials that uh, don't remain magnetized we call magnetically soft. Uh, that's the hysteresis loop. That's the loop on the right-hand side at the bottom. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, how, the shape and how it behaves. The ones that remain magnet, uh, magnetic, uh, these are permanent magnets. Uh, they're difficult to change, and they have a hysteresis loop like the one uh, on the left. This thing, hysteresis, is kind of the, uh, what do I want to say, the hallmark or kind of the key characteristic of permanent magnets that makes them uh, difficult to work with. Uh, hysteresis does not only occur with uh, uh, magnetic materials, but it's probably one of the first places that you might encounter it. But it's this idea that we have a uh, uh, response, but the response that we get to whatever stimulus we apply is, is delayed. And the stimulus that we're going to apply, we're gonna actually going to work through a hysteresis loop here. Um, and, uh, and see what happens. But the stimulus that we're going to apply is, is a magnetic field. And then the response that we're going to look at is magnetization or flux density. Uh, but the thing I was taught in graduate school that stuck with me all this time is the idea that if you show me a hysteresis loop, I want to look at its size and its shape. And if I can do that, then I can give you some clues about uh, what kind of material we have, what kind of properties it has. and um, and, and, and so that's, that's really the key parameter that we're uh, looking for. All the parameters that you see on a data sheet are, uh, uh, come off of this. So it's a, it's a very fundamental uh, uh, thing. Uh, the way I always present this is uh, I, I think there's a lot of information all at once. So I, I fight the urge to uh, put down everything that you ever want to know in one uh, little chart and hope that everybody uh, gets it. So my my preferred way of doing this is I deconstruct the curve and uh, say, all right, well, what do we know and what are we looking at? So the first thing we see are the, uh, just the axes. And so my x-axis is my uh, applied magnetic field, and my y-axis is the magnetization. So remember the h is the uh, stimulus that we're applying to it, and then the magnetization is the response. And if we walked into any hardware store and bought a nut or a bolt and said, let's go home and measure a, a hysteresis loop on it, we could do that. It's uh, likely steel. And uh, if we make a nice sample, we can put it in some kind of uh, test equipment, measure it. It's going to start off at the origin because it's got no magnetization. We buy it in the store. It's not magnetized. And uh, we're not applying any magnetic field to it yet. So it starts at the origin. Uh, and then we, as we apply the magnetic field, you see that uh, the magnetization uh, first increases. Uh, it moves up quite um, sharply. Uh, and then it starts to uh, level off. Uh, and we get this value called uh, M sub S, uh, saturation magnetization. Uh, what that means is that that's as much magnetization as we can get out of that particular uh, material. We could apply more magnetic field. Um, but we wouldn't get a different answer. So we could take our samples to the National High Field Magnet Laboratory in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, tell them to give it all it's got, and we'd still get the same answer as a very modest field uh, done in a lab somewhere, uh, somewhere else. Uh, so this M sub S is a very fundamental material property. Uh, so it's one of the ones that we will uh, uh, hang on to. And then we reverse the field and see what happens when we um, reduce the uh, applied field. Well, the applied field goes down to zero and actually goes a little bit negative here. But what we find is that we still have some magnetization that remains. Uh, we call this intercept uh, B sub R, or remnant magnetization. It's got quite a few names. Uh, but it's the idea, and it's the fundamental idea of permanent magnets, is the, the idea that we still have some uh, magnetization that remains even when the applied field is removed altogether. That's a great sign. So that's a good starting point for uh, any permanent magnet. 
Uh, but we need to do a little bit more than this. Uh, we need to go negative in field. And so when we do, uh, we find that the magnetization uh, decreases uh, and it goes through zero. Uh, this place where it goes through zero is what we call uh, HCI, uh, intrinsic coercivity, coercive field. Uh, the names are a little bit muddled on this. Sometimes the I in the subscript is in the front. Sometimes people use a J. Uh, but it's still, uh, no matter what you call it exactly, uh, the fundamental concept is the same, and it's the field required to reduce the magnetization to zero. Uh, the other way people will uh, talk about this is they'll call it uh, a resistance to demagnetization, because it seems like, well, yeah, if, if I do something to a material and its a magnetization is, is now zero, I, I guess I've demagnetized it. So that's the significance of that. Uh, this is, a, again, an important parameter. It gets reported on, on all the data sheets, uh, and it helps us to understand how something's going to uh, operate in an uh, adverse environment, meaning uh, other magnetic fields around. Uh, also, it's a fairly temperature-sensitive parameter, so we worry about that, uh, too. If we go on here and, and go uh, more negative in field, uh, we start to see some symmetry pop up. If we go far enough in the negative direction, we'll see that we flatten out, and there's a, an M sub S value down here, uh, and, and it's just the, the negative of the, the one we had uh, in the first quadrant. So if we continue on and uh, come back down to zero, again, we get a, a symmetric situation that there was a B sub bar up at the top. There's also a negative B sub bar uh, on the bottom. I don't mark that because it gets, it's, it's just mildly redundant. Uh, and, and so, uh, and then to finish it up, we can go uh, back up and, and saturate it in the in the positive direction again. Uh, this is what's called a uh, major hysteresis loop, and the, the major means that it's been uh, completely saturated in uh, both directions. Uh, when we use permanent magnets, we want them to be fully saturated. Uh, soft magnetic materials, we don't. Uh, that's a whole different story. Uh, but for these, we want this nice hysteresis loop. Uh, having shown you a nice hysteresis loop, I will tell you that almost nobody sees these things because, uh, uh, for especially for rare earth permanent magnets, it's very difficult to uh, get the entire loop. Uh, you don't have enough magnetic field. So uh, usually what they'll uh, measure is, is the second quadrant, the region between B sub R and HCI. And, and that's where most of the most magnets operate, one, and where most of the interesting information is, uh, too. So let's press on. So the difference between hard and soft, uh, it's a terminology uh, idea, I guess. Uh, it, and it goes back to a very long time ago. Um, you know, the, the first uh, uh, real magnetic materials uh, started to emerge when, when people made nice steel. So at the end of the 1800s. And um, there was a subtle difference uh, in the, the relative hardness of the two materials, that something that was physically soft also turned out to be uh, magnetically soft. Uh, magnetically soft materials, the curve here that uh, with a high uh, B sub R uh, and the very low uh, HCI. Uh, the hard magnetic material was also mechanically hard. And uh, it, it has a, maybe a somewhat lower B value of B sub R, but it has a huge value of, of HCI. So for permanent magnets, we like that. That's, that's desired behavior. Uh, but uh, this distinction between hard and soft, uh, we still use those words, but it has nothing to do anymore with their physical properties. Uh, the permanent magnet world gave up on steels um, somewhere before the Great Depression. So. Uh, it's, they're not really modern materials by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, a typical soft magnetic material would have a hysteresis loop that uh, looks like this. Uh, this is from our friends at KJS Associates. Um, and notice here uh, that the loop is, is very, very narrow. Uh, the amount of magnetic field, uh, the HCI, is, it's, it's one Ørsted, which is a pretty tiny field. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field, I think, is about a tenth of an Ørsted. So this is saying uh, a very tiny magnetic field will uh, reverse this material. Now, that's the hallmark of a soft magnetic material. Um, 
sometimes we use these materials to carry a lot of magnetic flux. Uh, that's the type of application, so like a housing for a motor, uh, something like that. We need to carry a lot of flux. We like iron. Uh, if it's a very demanding application, you might use uh, iron cobalt. That's a little pricey. Um, sometimes we're looking for what's called high permeability. Permeability refers to the initial slope of the curve as we leave the origin. And really what you're looking for there, this would be like for a, a core or a choke or some kind of inductor where we want um, a very strong response to a very tiny magnetic field. Uh, and so materials like permaloy and soft ferrite uh, do that well. And then uh, probably the biggest use for soft magnetic materials is the last one, which is uh, in transformers. Uh, it's hard to imagine what life would be like if we did not have uh, transformers. Uh, so we're lucky that we live in a world where iron's so abundant and we can do all this stuff. Um, but silicon iron, amorphous materials, or just even uh, a low carbon steel do pretty well as a, uh, as a soft magnetic material. So the hallmark here is that the hysteresis loop is, is high, uh, high is good, but the, maybe the more important thing is the second one, and that is that the, the hysteresis loop is really, really uh, skinny. And that's what we're looking for for a, a soft magnetic material. Uh, for permanent magnets, we're looking for almost the opposite. Um, we want a high HCI, meaning that we want the width of the hysteresis loop to be as wide as, as possible. Uh, high B sub R is asking that the, uh, the height of the hysteresis loop be uh, quite high, too. Uh, the applications you probably know already, motors and generators, I left speakers out of there. They should go in there, too. Um, all kinds of sensors and actuators. Um, but there are really only four materials that kind of fit the bill on this. And if you think about it, it's really these first two requirements that, that kind of uh, narrow our choices. Uh, you can find materials that have high HCI. You can find materials that have high B sub R. Um, but it's unusual to find materials that have uh, both at the same time. So I compare uh, permanent magnets to um, uh, asking somebody if they can walk and, and chew gum at the same time. Uh, there are people that can do that, uh, not, not as many as you might like, perhaps. So there are a couple of ways that we keep score here. And this is where it gets confusing, but I'll try to be uh, uh, very clear and very basic about it. Um, uh, the first one, uh, first thing that we look at is uh, B. It's called magnetic flux density or induction. And I describe it as the fundamental reason we would uh, use a magnet, uh, because people buy magnets because they supply magnetic flux. Uh, if they didn't do that particularly well, then there would be no point for them. Um, the second thing that we would have to look at is uh, the magnetic field. This was the um, x-axis on our hysteresis loop. Uh, usually this magnetic field comes from a current. Uh, so you could imagine a coil of wire running some number of amps through it. We create a, a, a magnetic field based on that. There are other ways to do that, but that's kind of the simplest way uh, to do it. And then the third vector is, is what we call M, or magnetization. Since I'm a materials guy, and I'm always responsible for what's going on inside the magnet, for me, this is the most important parameter. And that's why I, I say it's, it's a material property. Uh, people who use magnets, on the other hand, usually like B much better, because what they're interested in is the amount of magnetic flux. And specifically, they're interested in the amount of magnetic flux that's available outside the magnet. They really can't get inside the magnet to do anything. Uh, so they're limited to what, what they can get outside. But these three vectors are, are not independent of each other. Uh, they're related. Uh, and one of the other complications is this last point, that there are two main systems of units that get used to describe magnetic materials. Uh, SI, which is becoming more dominant, but there's still a lot of data uh, and people train, like me, and CGS units. And so you'll see this mixture of units out there. And one of the complications with all this is that the two systems of units write the equation, the relationship between induction, magnetization, and magnetic field, they write it differently. Uh, but the fundamental thing is captured in the second to last sentence here, the idea that induction, magnetic flux density, if we see magnetic flux density anywhere, uh, 
Uh, it's either got to come from uh, a magnetization of a material or from a magnetic field, a current. Um, and usually this is a point where somebody asks about, well, what about the Earth's magnetic field? And this statement kind of helps us think about it a little bit differently, maybe. Uh, the idea that, well, we're actually in this case seeing a flux density on the face of the Earth. It isn't clear to us which one it's coming from, maybe, whether it's a magnetization or a magnetic field. But uh, I'll tell you one additional fact that I didn't mention when I showed the globe, and that is inside the Earth's interior, it's rather warm, and it's hard for materials to be uh, magnetic when it's hot. Uh, so it seems like the Earth's magnetic field is probably due to uh, a current. And that also fits nicer with the idea that um, uh, the location of the magnetic pole can move around or uh, even flip. Because reversing the flow of a current um, conceptually isn't that difficult. So uh, that, that's kind of where, where we're going at with, with that. But let's look at the, the three vectors here in, in some detail. So flux density or induction B is really a concentration of magnetic flux. Uh, the number of flux lines, if we look, go back to our horseshoe magnet, the tip where all the uh, iron filings seem to collect is, is telling us there's a strong concentration of, of magnetic flux right there. And so what we want to try to do um, uh, somehow is count the number of lines of magnetic flux that, that pass through an area. Uh, we also need to take into account the fact that uh, uh, how we orient this area with respect to the uh, uh, pole, uh, and that's in the equation down below. But the, the fundamental thing that we're after is uh, lines of flux per area. So the uh, CGS unit for all this is uh, lines per square centimeter uh, or gauss. Um, in SI units, they talk about uh, Weber's per square meter uh, or Tesla. Uh, occasionally, people will just write, want to talk about magnetic flux. That's the the phi here, uh, so it's B times an area, and then this cosine theta reflects the fact that um, there's an orientation of B, there's an orientation of the area. If those two are lined up, then we get the, uh, the most amount of flux. Uh, kind of like uh, sunbathing, I guess. If you uh, orient yourself well with respect to the sun, then you get the, the best tan. Um, magnetic fields usually caused by a current flowing through a wire. So a simple way to imagine this is uh, uh, the solenoid that's shown in the picture there. Uh, if we put uh, some number of amperes through uh, this coil at the, at the center point, in particular, we'll get a, a fairly concentrated magnetic field. It'll exist throughout that solenoid. Uh, it's a little bit weaker at the ends than it is at the center, but it's, uh, it's, it's an easy way to make a, a magnetic field. Uh, it can be measured either in uh, Ersted, which is a CGS unit, or uh, ampere turn per meter, which is SI units. Ampere turn per meter probably makes a little bit more sense in the sense that most people understand what an ampere is. And so an ampere and a turn per meter of distance, it's like, OK, that I, you have some idea of what that, what that is. Uh, to be honest, for me, Ersted, I think I always uh, think of in terms of the Earth's magnetic field. And, and that's, that's probably the easiest way for me to figure it out. Uh, magnetization, like I said, is the magnetic state of a uh, material. Uh, if we look at a piece of iron, and you could imagine this blue uh, disc on the bottom right-hand corner as being a, a piece of uh, iron, we could measure a magnetization from that. And if we did some dimensions and weighed the sample, we could, we could actually figure out how many iron atoms are in that sample and say, well, gee, what if all the magnetization is divided up between those atoms? That idea actually isn't too far off. And we could find out uh, how much uh, each atom contributes to it. And what we find is that uh, inside each atom, there are electrons. And there's some electrons. All electrons spin. Uh, they all orbit. But it's really the idea that they spin that's most important here. And there's this quantum mechanical idea that uh, they tend to pair up uh, mostly, but they don't always. And the exceptions are when we're filling up interior shells. This means um, 3D and 4F electrons, if you remember your chemistry. But if you look at the periodic table, what it's really saying is that uh, you're likely to find this idea of unpaired electron spins with transition metals and with the rare earths. 
and that, in fact, is where we spend a lot of our time. Um, so we can measure magnetization several ways. Uh, there's a unit uh, Gauss uh, that's CGS for 4 pi m. There's a EMU. Uh, it's electromagnetic unit. It's not the bird on the left uh, for uh, m. That's also a CGS unit. And then the SI units are usually either um, uh, Tesla, or I guess you could use uh, ampere uh, turns per, uh, per meter. So these are how the equations are written in the two systems of units. Uh, it, it holds true to the spirit of the sentence that I put out a couple of slides back, that uh, induction is a combination of H and M. And so in CGS units, it's pretty uh, simple. We just say that B is equal to H plus 4 pi m. And the 4 pi goes back to the area of a sphere if you're a real stickler on the, on the constants there. Um, in SI units, the equation's a little bit different. There's a constant that gets thrown in. And it, that goes back to the fact that the units for B and the units for H and M are different. And we need this constant fudge factor, whatever you want to call it, uh, to help, uh, help us to go back and forth between uh, Tesla that we use for B and amper turns per meter that we use for H and M. Uh, so this makes life a little bit confusing. Uh, you'll frequently find uh, magnetic data in one set of units or the other. Um, if you find it in both, uh, usually it's both correct, uh, but um, occasionally somebody will make a mistake and you'll realize that uh, they have a bias towards one system uh, or the other. Uh, as somebody who's written a lot of data sheets in my day, uh, uh, this gets to be a fun area just to make sure that you've got everything laid out uh, correctly. Uh, the IEEE Magnetic Society uh, makes a much bigger chart than this uh, on different magnetic parameters and the different symbols that get used and uh, converting back and forth between them. Uh, this is kind of the abbreviated version that just makes sense when you're uh, limiting your discussion to, uh, uh, to permanent magnets. So I put that there for your uh, uh, later enjoyment, I guess I'll say. So what makes a material a ferromagnetic material? Uh, again, we're trying to ask it to do several things uh, at once. Uh, this makes it a little bit difficult. And so in nature, we don't find a lot of ferromagnetic uh, material. We actually want, I guess, four things to happen at once. Uh, we want to get a little magnetization from each atom, which comes from some number of spinning electrons. Uh, but we also need on top of that a uh, cooperative effect. We call it the uh, exchange interaction that would keep neighboring spins uh, parallel to each other because uh, we, we need that. If, if we get those two, then we can get this effect called uh, spontaneous magnetization. Uh, the idea is that uh, something can become magnetized with almost no effort whatsoever. You know, the, the first magnets were discovered by uh, shepherds. Uh, they didn't have magnetizers, um, but there was lightning. And the lightning probably magnetized the lodestones that they saw that were now able to stick to each other. So uh, it, it, is that sp spontaneous? Well, it's, it's nearly spontaneous. And this whole idea of ferromagnetism, it's a delicate balance, and it's always fighting against uh, temperature. And so the interaction uh, can be, uh, it's reduced as the temperature goes up. Excuse me. And then finally uh, destroyed at the Curie temperature. In other words, things become non-magnetic at that point. If we uh, look at the periodic table uh, and say, OK, uh, which elements are ferromagnetic at, uh, at, at room temperature, we get four. It's kind of out of 100 and, what is it, 18 or 120 elements, uh, to come back with only four as ferromagnetic is, is a little bit depressing. Uh, but that's what we have to work with. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have ferromagnetic materials that are alloys. Uh, there are some famous alloys that don't contain uh, one of these four. Um, manganese aluminum carbon, manganese bismuth. Um, I'm sure there are a few others that, uh, given time, I could remember. But it's, uh, uh, it, it's a rather narrow showing, I'll, uh, I'll put it that way. Here's the, uh, a picture of the, uh, what might be happening with the electron spin. One spinning electron, uh, Niels Bohr, uh, 
calculated a long time ago, produces a very small uh, magnetization. And so this, uh, that amount of magnetization is now named after him. It's called the Bohr magneton. Uh, usually, uh, the electrons are, are uh, paired so that there's one spinning up, one spinning down. That's what you see in the chart at the bottom here for iron. In the 1s shell, there, uh, there's one up, one down, 2s, same, same idea. And it's only when we get out here to the 3d shell that we have uh, one pair that's up and down, and we have four uh, unbalanced uh, spins that are all pointing up. This is where we get our magnetization. Uh, this picture makes it seem like there should be four electrons. If you go through and do the calculation, you end up with 2.2. Uh, but that's the, that's the wonder of quantum mechanics is that our, our classical minds don't always give us the right uh, idea. So the exchange interaction is really this uh, interaction between neighboring atoms. In ferromagnetic materials, these, um, uh, it, it, it compels neighboring atoms to all point in the same direction. Uh, that's what we call a ferromagnetic interaction. Uh, they can, other possibilities uh, can happen. Uh, we can have anti-parallel, that's anti-ferromagnetism, we saw that, and some complex things. But in all cases, they're competing against uh, thermal energy. Uh, if, uh, because as the uh, uh, th temperature goes up, the vibrations become more uh, severe, and, and then finally, uh, the thermal energy is stronger than the, the uh, interaction. Uh, the other thing that we see with permanent magnets is something called anisotropy. Uh, and, and it's this idea that um, uh, we get slightly different uh, properties uh, depending on the direction of our measurement. Uh, it happens a lot with uh, magnetic materials, but it can also happen with uh, other types of properties, uh, mechanical, optical, electrical. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, the example I want to give is for uh, cobalt. Uh, this is part of a hysteresis loop. Uh, the x-axis, it says, is H Ersted. Okay, so that's a magnetic field. Uh, the y-axis is M EMUs per cubic centimeter. Well, that's a magnetization. The sample that we're measuring here is uh, cobalt. Uh, cobalt is, uh, uh, has a crystal structure that's hexagonal. You may be able to see the hexagons in the uh, top and the bottom uh, of the crystal structure here. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a hint that there's also a hexagon in the center one, that's not as obvious uh, until you draw more atoms in there. But they actually measured the magnetization in two directions in this uh, sample. When they measured it straight up, that's what's called easy, you get this curve that shoots straight up and saturates very quickly. Uh, by what? Maybe 2,000 Ersted, it's fully saturated, and we increase the magnetic field to uh, almost 10,000, and it just stays flat as a board. Um, it, it's saturated very simply. Uh, same sample, but we just turn it 90 degrees and measure the magnetization uh, uh, perpendicular to it, and we find that, well, the magnetization increases, but nothing like what we had before. It kind of shoots off at what I guess I'd call a 45 degree angle, uh, works its way up here. It never quite flattens out. Uh, the only thing we're left to say is, well, if we had a little bit more magnetic field, likely these two curves would intersect uh, and, and they would both be saturated. And that, in fact, is, is true. So we get an isotropy in materials. And for permanent magnets, this is actually a very nice uh, property because we want things to be difficult to demagnetize. And having anisotropy uh, helps us. We often have anisotropic materials, but we don't always see this effect until we get down to a small level. Most of the materials we have are uh, polycrystalline. Uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's kind of averaged out. Uh, if you think about going to the lumber yard, you know that the, the lumber is anisotropic. The, mag, uh, the mechanical properties are different uh, with the grain as opposed to uh, uh, perpendicular to the grain. But the, uh, uh, the isotropic material that comes out of that would be particle board, where you take uh, small pieces of wood and glue them all together in a random array, and you end up with something that's then isotropic. Um, OK. And the last thing I want to talk about on, in this section is something called magnetic domains. It's the idea that materials can uh, divide themselves. 
uh, it actually lowers their energy to do that. The picture on the top left here that's a, a, a block sample, I'll call it, that's magnetized. Uh, it's got north poles on the top, south poles on the bottom. It's a single region that's all magnetized the same way. We call that a domain. Um, a, this material can actually divide itself under the right conditions and come up with a structure that's shown next to it in, in figure B, um, where the magnetization now, the net magnetization of the sample is now zero, because there's one half of it that's pointing up, one half of it that's pointing down. And this also has a lower energy state uh, than the one on the left. So uh, uh, these things can happen. With permanent magnets, generally we want to um, avoid this. In other words, we want to make domains. Uh, once they're there, we don't want them to be able to move around or uh, change their configuration, something like that. Um, and, and in the interest of time, I think I'll just move on. Um, the thermal part of this is captured in, in this slide, and it's about the Curie temperature. Uh, this is the uh, saturation magnetization of uh, nickel, uh, and it, nickel's ferromagnetic. It was in our periodic table. Uh, it has a Curie temperature, I think, of about 350 uh, degrees C. Uh, and this is what happens to the saturation magnetization, that near absolute zero, it's, uh, it's, it's relatively high, pretty flat, uh, dropping off slightly. And then eventually here, we feel like we're falling off a cliff. And by the time we hit 300 and degrees or so, it's just falling rapidly. And we hit this point called PC, Curie temperature, uh, named after Pierre Curie, uh, where the magnetization is uh, zero. And so this shows the effect of the, the thermal energy on the, uh, on the magnetization. And this effect will reverse. If we go up and down in temperature and apply a small magnetic field, we can uh, get this all to uh, come back again. Typical demagnetization curves that we see with permanent magnets look more like this than the hysteresis loops that I showed at the beginning. Uh, but many of the things we've seen, uh, typical of most engineering things, we try to cram as much information as we can on one, uh, one piece of paper. Um, but let, let's go through here and see what we have. Um, on the y-axis, on the right-hand side, we have uh, just B and J in Tesla. So that's SI units, uh, and that, that's what that's reporting on. So the, the B or the mu naught times M. On the left-hand side, it says 4 pi M and B in uh, kg kilogauss. Um, here you can see the uh, conversion between kilogauss and uh, Tesla. It's pretty easy. Uh, 10 kilogauss is equal to 1 Tesla, and those, they do line up pretty nicely. That's easy. Uh, on the x-axis on the bottom, we have H, magnetic field, and it's measured in kiloamps per meter. So that's an SI uh, scale. And then on the top, they have H in kilowarstead, and that's a, a CGS scale. There are two curves here. Uh, the one we saw in the hysteresis loop was actually the, um, uh, the top one. Uh, it's called several names, um, the intrinsic curve, uh, the magnetization curve, uh, but it's, it's measuring uh, M. And so the number that you read on that would actually be, to the left-hand side, it would be uh, 4 pi M, and it would be in kilogauss. On the right-hand side, it would be J, and it would be in Tesla. And our old friends are still here. Uh, B sub bar is the intercept on the y-axis up there, and HCI is our intercept on the x-axis, where the magnetization is zero. So this curve is following the magnetization of our part. The bottom curve, the one that looks like it's going down at roughly a 45 degree angle, uh, this is sometimes called the normal curve, the induction curve. It's a measure of B. It's a measure of the flux density that's available. Uh, so we're measuring B in either uh, Tesla or kilogauss. And uh, it intersects the curve at B sub R, but drops off. We also hit a point where the B is zero. Uh, that's given a slightly different name. That's called H sub C. Uh, it's the uh, field required to reduce the induction to zero. Um, you may wonder why the normal curve is less uh, than the uh, intrinsic curve. It goes back to the equations that we wrote that related B and H and M. 
And in this part of the curve, H is always a negative number. So if B is a combination of M, which is positive, and H, which is negative, then it seems like D ought to be less. Uh, the only thing that I haven't defined here is this thing called BH max. It's the most commonly used and probably commonly misunderstood magnetic parameter. Uh, it represents the idea that when, uh, for a good permanent magnet, we like to have a combination of magnetic flux, which is the y-axis, in the face of an adverse magnetic field, which is the x-axis. So if we went down this normal curve and looked at the combination, the product of B times H, we would find that it increases, 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 uh, peaks and then starts to decrease again. In fact, the next slide is a plot of this, so let's pull that up. Um, it's the idea that if we, uh, on the right-hand side, we're looking at uh, B times H, and uh, on the bottom, it's the um, mu naught H, it's the magnetic field, uh, that we get this uh, inverted parabola, and this point BH max is the peak here. Uh, we generally try to design things so that they operate sort of in this region. Uh, there's also a bias towards keeping a little bit to the right on this curve rather than a little bit to the left. Uh, notice the units we get for BH max uh, on the Y scale here, uh, megajoules, millions of joules per cubic meter. Uh, so BH max is kind of a, um, uh, an energy density, right? amount of energy per uh, cubic meter. and um, so it's, 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 it's a useful figure of merit uh, and, and probably a nice way to, uh, uh, to look at it. The other parameter that gets thrown around a lot is one called H sub K. Uh, it has several definitions, but this is the one that I've always used. Uh, the K stands for uh, knee, and it's the idea that we would like the magnetization uh, to remain high uh, out to some very large magnetic field, and then it free to drop off. So we pick a point that's 90% uh, of B sub R and say, well, how much field is required to drop the magnetization to 90% or have a, uh, the, the, B, the magnetization drop 10% from B sub R? And we get this value uh, HK. Uh, a good value of HK is very close to HCI, uh, and that's a clue that your, your magnet is fairly stable. Uh, when I've always, when I've been involved in the processing of magnets, this is actually the most process sensitive parameter that you have. And so I, I would always keep an eye on H sub K uh, because it seemed like if things were well under control with that, uh, everything else would fall into, uh, fall into place. Some, uh, a chart of basic parameters here. And okay, we're doing okay on time, I think. Um, I won't do too much on this one because you can spend a lot of time on this chart, but uh, there are many ways to characterize a magnet, and one of the reasons why we end up with four commercially viable materials uh, today is that each one offers something good into the, uh, uh, to the marketplace, but it, it, like most engineering materials, it also comes with some baggage that you have to uh, accept. I'll point out a few of them. Uh, probably the most obvious is the, for neodymium iron boron, uh, the baggage that comes about is the low Curie temperature, uh, but the energy product is quite high, especially for the centered variety. Uh, Samarium cobalt has very high HCI. Uh, the raw material prices can be um, a problem depending on the application. Uh, Alnico magnets uh, are very good. Uh, this alpha is a, a temperature coefficient of B sub R, uh, very nice on that but it has almost no coercivity. Um, ferrite magnets have the lowest B sub R and energy product on the chart, uh, but the raw material prices are very low, and uh, the material's an oxide, so you don't have corrosion problems. So there, 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 there are pluses and minuses to, uh, uh, to everything, and that's part of the, the design process. This chart tries to show uh, the progress of permanent magnets over time. Many people will plot something similar uh, and they'll just look at uh, energy product and not much else, uh, and you see things zooming up into the, uh, into the stratosphere. But I, I changed this around a little bit. You notice my scale on the y-axis is logarithmic. I did that deliberately to um, give myself some space uh, to show some materials that uh, 
uh, don't get mentioned uh, otherwise. But you see that today uh, there, there are many, many materials that are uh, commercially viable, from bonded ferrite up to centered neo. And if energy product were the one and only important parameter, then everything would be done in centered neo. But of course, you know, we go home and look at the refrigerator and find that, well, no, bonded magnet does a nice job there. And you see ferrite and speakers and some motors uh, and other places. So there's, like, there's a place for these things. Uh, but occasionally things will uh, disappear, uh, sometimes because of cost of raw materials like platinum cobalt or environmental problems like elongated uh, single domain. Um, our friends at BACT do a nice job in their catalog of trying to compare various materials because people will ask the question about which one's better or uh, something like that. And everybody gets a little nervous when you ask this question. So they come at it from a very nice point of view. And I say, well, you can only make a comparison if you've asked the magnet to do a particular job. So they gave the magnet the job of uh, it has to provide a, a magnetic field of 100 millitesla and at some point uh, 5 millimeters from the surface of the, the cylinder. And so it shows four materials. Uh, Vacodim is their uh, trade name for neodymium iron boron. Uh, Vacomax is samarium cobalt. Uh, ferrite is ferrite. And then there's that Alnico grade here. Uh, notice the, uh, they, they actually talk about it in terms of volume, and that's okay. I converted it all into grams because I thought that was probably a little bit more telling because people tend to think about things more in terms of weight than volume. Uh, but it, it's, it's a nice way to compare materials. If we asked a different question, we'd get a different answer. So don't, don't take these numbers too, uh, too seriously, but it's a good, uh, good reference. So these are my requirements for a permanent magnet. Uh, the first three came from uh, my late distinguished colleague, uh, Ed Wallace. Uh, I added the uh, four, five, and six. And my friend, uh, uh, Reinhold Sternad, added the one about uh, being able to magnetize it. Uh, people often overlook that and then uh, get a surprise at the end. But uh, uh, the, the things that we would like magnetically, which uh, Dr. Wallace uh, lays out very nicely, uh, and then I looked at the chart that I just showed you and said, well, uh, if this were true, then a lot of things that disappeared shouldn't have disappeared. And why is that? And so that's where I came up with uh, four, five, and, and six to go along with it. So I think we've come to the end here, or close to the end. Uh, uh, this is just a quick uh, overview of some of the things that I do with my consulting business. Obviously, technical training is number one. But I do work with a lot of people on trying to figure out magnet problems. So it's always fun. OK. All they right. are well, our thank topic. you. Yes, thank you, Stan. We, we did get a few questions that have come in. And we, of course, want to add, uh, open it up to questions at this time. So if you do have a question for Stan, feel free go. to type it into your questions panel of your webinar screen. Uh, if we don't get to your questions by the end of this webinar, we will follow up via email. So we did have a question that came in, and it, I, I believe it referred to slide 39 that you had up. Okay. Um, it came in from one of the audience members, and they had asked, what happens to magnet B after it's driven down to HK? Does it return oh, to BR? Oh, oh, here. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> yep, that's the one. Yep. And then um, it says, yeah. what happens to magnet B? Yep. Yeah. There's, there's a, uh, an effect called recoil. And it tries to capture the idea that um, it may not be completely reversible when you uh, uh, come back to zero from, from HK. Uh, so you can have a little bit of loss. It, it, it's, um, sometimes people will try to uh, capture that. There's a, a parameter called recoil permeability that tries to look at the slope of that. Um, but it's one of those things that if it's important to you, you probably have to measure it. Because I think the answer you get um, depends on many factors, some of which you know, are magnet process related, but some of the actual field and the dimensions of your part. And so it, it's complicated. But you may not get it all back, I guess, is the fundamental thing. But okay. you should expect to get most of it back. Um, the next question comes in. Is any comment about magnet lifetime for sensor and actuator applications? 
Well, you know, we call them permanent magnets. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, like Superman, uh, you know, uh, Superman had to worry about kryptonite. Uh, the, the, the things that are kryptonite here are um, uh, exposure to temperature, uh, exposure to adverse fields, um, and I guess the third one that doesn't come up very often but is there is uh, uh, radiation. And so uh, there are tests you can do to try to get a feel of, of how uh, well things perform, but generally if, if things are designed well, the magnet will last forever. Uh, but it is certainly possible that you could lose a few percent of flux, uh, usually early on in its life. Uh, so one way people fight that is um, uh, they age it before they put it in, in use and get that out of the mm -hmm. way. Awesome. Well, well, thank you again for everyone with questions. I know at this time, just for the sake of time, we did get a lot of questions in the questions panel that we didn't get to, but don't worry, we will follow up with all questions via email after this webinar has concluded. And again, I want to thank Stan and, and our participants today. This is the first webinar in, in our PMD series. We will have a total of three. So please join us for the other two. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Dexter Magnetics, and Tangum Engineering. And as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and a link will be emailed to you with the recording to this webinar within the next 24 hours. And again, if you did have a question that was not answered during the presentation, we will follow up with you via email after this webinar has concluded. Lastly, if you're interested in learning more or joining the Permanent Magnet Division, please visit www.motioncontrolonline.org for more information. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. There we go.